For almost 40 years, Dick the Bruiser has grappled his way across the wrestling mats of America and Japan. The legendary world's most dangerous wrestler isn't really that dangerous at his north side Indianapolis home, but does still step in the ring from time to time when he's not color commentating or cutting commercials. To his fans, the Bruiser always has a snarl on his face, is always ready for battle. Because I've been in these battles. But to his friends and family, Dick Athelis is as genuine as they come. And as we found out recently, with Dick the Bruiser, what you see is what you get. Just take my hand, my beautiful woman. <laughs> Dick, thanks for having us here today. Your name, Dick the Bruiser, is legendary in wrestling. And uh, a lot of people may not realize it, but you're still wrestling today among, right. among doing other things. How has the profession changed today as compared to when you started wrestling in the 50s? Well, when I started wrestling in the 50s, it's exactly like it is today. There was a lot of show business. In fact, that's how I became popular in wrestling, Karen. There was a lot of show business in wrestling. If that was uh, Gorgeous George era. And he had curls, and he would come out and throw gold uh, hair clips at people. And all the wrestlers followed his, his uh, lead. They all had big fancy robes, and they all had fancy pants, and they all had fancy hairdos. And uh, then along came Dick the Bruiser in the middle 1950s, and all that dumbbell had was an old pair of tights <laughs> and some shoes that he bought at any sporting goods store. And that was the uh, complete things that I used, other than a good fist and a punch in the nose and a kick in the pants. That was what was different. I came out and everybody said, what's that halfwit doing out there? He hasn't got any, had a hair crew cut just like I wear now. He doesn't have any show business. And then I'd, I'd go ahead and beat up these guys so bad they'd say, but really, he's got something. He really goes there. <laughs> Did you do that intentionally? No uh, oh, pop yeah. I was playing at Green Bay at the time and I just continued the way I felt. You talk about playing for Green Bay, you, that's the Green Bay Packers, of course, you played with them for about five years. That's right. How did pro football compare to pro wrestling? It's about the same. The only thing different in pro football and pro wrestling, once the season starts in pro football, you've got a week to recuperate from your Sunday's actions. Whatever you get injured, why well, you can kind of nurse and take it easy until the next Sunday. And in pro, uh, pro wrestling, you get hurt, you get injured, Sometimes you wrestle every day for a week at a time, or sometimes every other day. So the only real difference, uh, body-wise, is that you don't have the time to recuperate in pro wrestling. So you still wrestle today, but as compared to um, your heyday, how, what's yeah, the difference? I wrestle in maybe uh, when uh, I'm really out on the road wrestling all over the world. I'll wrestle maybe three times a week. Compared, I used to wrestle sometimes, I'd wrestle six, seven, eight times a week. How in the world did you ever get started in pro wrestling? Well, I went to Purdue and I wrestled in high school and I, I had an athletic scholarship to Purdue where I was only able, to, in other words, uh, if I took the scholarship, they would only let me play football. So, but I worked out with a wrestling team all the time and uh, loved wrestling, but I couldn't wrestle on the team. So I wrestled at Purdue, only just worked out with the fellas. And then from Purdue, I went to University of Nevada. And uh, when my class graduated at Purdue, I was able to start playing football in, uh, in the late 1950s. So you played for the Green Bay. And at that time, you made about $6,000 a year. When oh, you yes. Uh, don't, uh, I thought it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. I was making, I was a captain of the line and making the average lineman, well, that was about an average lineman's salary. The minimum was $4,000. Now the minimum's about sixty or 70000 And I uh, made 4000 or uh, 6000 4000 my first year. And then I really got big raises, about 500 every year. <laughs> and uh, I was, uh, anyway, the last uh, couple of years, 6,000, 6,500. And I thought, oh, boy, I was making more money than anybody in the world. And I just loved it. And we traveled and worked as hard as they do today. And it was, if I may say so, Karen, these football players, uh, 
we had rules uh, that they would they would be so hurt and they they just couldn't take it like for instance when i first started playing they had a rule where you had to hold the man down for at least a t one second without any forward movement in other words when you tackle a ball carrier the guy had to stay in without forward movement for one second then that was a down and uh, other words so what would happen was that you tackle a guy and then everybody would pile on trying to hold that guy down <laughs> because if you tackle him his knees hit the ground he'd fall on down and as long as he kept wiggling or crawling or doing something to get forward motion there wasn't an end of the down most people don't know that no then Karen I also played in an era where they didn't have to have nose guards and in 50, uh, 50 I think it was 52 or 53 the nose guards came in and it was a levy that you had to have nose guards on the helmet well a lot of good that did me because all my teeth were already knocked out <laughs> it was too and it late. used to make me mad to think that these big sissies that I'm playing against are sitting there with all their teeth and I got no teeth and I had to wear a nose guard when I wasn't used to it. So what do you think of uh, today's NFL? You see all these contract disputes as compared well, to when you no, played. They're great players and they're big and they're strong. We had the same big six foot eight players. I was, when I played, I'm six foot. I was the shortest tackle in the league when I played, six foot. But there were plenty of six foot four, six foot five, six foot six, six foot eight tackles and, and uh, the only thing that's that are really bigger now than when I played is the guards are bigger. The guards now are as big as tackles when I, I was a tackle and a guard. But the, the men are beautiful and they've got in condition and everything, except when they get hurt, they're kind of crybabies, I think. You know, and uh, plus when I played, we only had 33 men on a team. There were only uh, 12 teams. 33 men on a team. Everybody was back from the Second World War. When I started playing at Green Bay, I was 20 years old, and I was the youngest guy on the team, and I was the only guy illegally drinking beer. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Oh, boy. And we were owned by the Miller Brewing Company. Karen. That's right, you were. And, and uh, after a game, thank God they had a uh, post-game Anyway, they would bring in a whole horse trough of beer. And the Green Bay team would go out so drunk after a game that we didn't know who we were, <laughs> whether we won or lost. So it's a myth that you were kicked out of the league. That's what uh, no, the that's, story... No, that, that the stories are wrong. I, the reason I left the league, I loved to play football. I was signed for the 1955 season and started, and then I, uh, I had made so much... I started wrestling off, on and off in 52, and in 55, instead of going back full time, I started and I, I made more in a half a season, uh, twice as much in half a season I did, I did playing a full season of football, wrestling. Mm -hmm. So I thought, oh, this just doesn't make sense. I mean, I've only been to college seven or eight years, and I can figure out that 15,000 in six months is better than uh, 6,000. <laughs> 6,000 in six months, which then uh, the other six, see, I went back and I was going back to Reno, Nevada. I went to school at the University of Nevada trying to get my degree, and I also worked for six years while I played ball. I went to school, like I've been to college about 10 or 15 years now. <laughs> but uh, I uh, went to school, and I also worked as a head security officer at Harold's Club, the world's biggest gambling club in Reno, Nevada, off, you know, when I wasn't going to school, I only took about four hours a semester, so it wasn't too heavy for me. You uh, talked a little bit about uh, wrestling today and how you think it's pretty much the same today as it pretty was. Pretty much the were. same. Like, today, uh, it goes through cycles. Today is back to the showmanship era, where 99% of the wrestlers are uh, really, you know, they've got, in fact, they've even gone beyond the showbiz era before I started because they, about half of them wear makeup and all kinds of uh, silly, uh, which to me is silly, but I mean, it, these guys like it. Why they, to me, they're hiding behind facades, uh, some kind of facial makeup, 
and uh, because a lot of people will say they liked wrestling better back in the days well, uh, when it, you were big. It really isn't any different other than the, the uh, outfits they wear and the, the makeup. They've got big funny hairdos again, but the makeup's the only thing I can see different. George and George wore a little makeup, but these guys, you know, they have all kinds of exotic. Uh, in fact, I think some of them are quite cute. I think they'd make <laughs> great exotic dancers, you know, and uh, they could go topless and without even getting arrested. I think it'd be terrific. So what do you think of Hulk Hogan? Is he a fierce competitor of yours, or do you admire his style, well, his no, marketing? I, in fact, uh, my company uh, that I work with and that I own part of, we started Hulk Hogan, and up until about seven, eight years ago, he was my tag, right. tag team partner. And uh, we found him in a band. He was playing in an, in an exotic nightclub as a, a band. And he was the drummer for a bunch of strippers. So how did you figure out that he should well, be a wrestler? He was working out with some of the wrestlers that worked for us. And they said, boy, he's strong, and he seems athletically inclined. He wanted to get into wrestling. So I've got to give the man credit. He went, and we taught him wrestling holes. He had never, I'll say another thing. Preface is most, even today, most of the wrestlers that are successful have wrestled amateur in high school, then in college, and AAU, most of them. So uh, it's really not a good idea just to decide one no, day no. that you want to be but a this pro wrestler. This fella made a transition from weightlifting, as I understand is about the only sport he ever indulged in, playing a drum, watching the girls, and then going, and the, uh, we taught him wrestling, and he took to it like a duck to water. It made a very good success of himself, and he is a good wrestler, as good as anybody. And plus, you know, he tries to uh, emulate the, the bruiser, only he's Doesn't taller everyone. Than Yeah, right. When I look at some of the wrestlers today, they look a lot more like bodybuilders, perhaps, than well, you guys in the past. Is there a problem at all with steroids in the business now? That's People right. thinking that that's they've, right. that I've, that's the uh, edge? I've fought against steroids for years and years. In fact, the first men that I knew, I wasn't really uh, that knowledgeable about steroids. I didn't really know what they were. I've weighed as much as 300 myself. I weigh 240, 242 now. But I've weighed as much like when I played Green Bay 300 and I've wrestled as high as 290 back and forth down. But I normally wrestle about 250. Can you imagine if I took steroids? Uh, you wouldn't be able, we wouldn't be able to get in this yard with me. Uh, steroids are fine for injuries. That's what they originally, like cortisones and those types, for injuries. Uh, but then the men started taking them because it's really a lot easier. You, you only have to work out about a fourth as hard with steroids to get a muscle and to get weight and mass, about, I'd say uh, on average, a quarter as hard as you would if you didn't take steroids. So naturally, everybody wants to, to do it the easy way, right? Mm -hmm. Plus, they will bulk you up. Like, uh, in other words, if I have to work four hours to get a certain look, I can do it in one hour with steroids. Plus, even look better than if, you know, you get to a point where you can't really look any better. But the steroids keep adding muscle and muscle, and mu most people don't know the reason how the steroids came to be uh, I wrestle in Japan a lot, and the stero and they in Japan they use it for the Kobe cattle, and uh, they shoot these cattle. All they do is stand in a pen like this, mm -hmm. and they shoot them all day long with steroids, and then they massage them so that the, their muscles aren't too stiff, and they make terrifically muscled cattle, which makes great meat, and that's what the steroids were. They originally intended it for then and now they're completely abused yeah now they're now the athletes so let me get back I uh, transgress a little uh, the steroids I first that I first realized were taking was a few of the wrestlers they didn't know what they were doing but they looked a lot bigger quickly and not so much more muscular because they didn't really know that you really had to work out with them they just thought you take them and you get muscle muscular 
that if you take steroids, you have to work out with them. But it also works twice as fast to make muscles or to make them evident. Right. So the wrestlers that I know, say 30 years ago, that took that's the first time I ever knew of them. All of them died. All the wrestlers of, died? All of them. And all, I only knew wrestlers that took it. And I'm sure many other people. But the ones 30 years ago have all succumbed. They've died. They've passed away because their hearts went boom. And some of them, their heads should have gone boom, too. But what it does, it, your muscles, uh, the heart's a muscle, and, you, and it doesn't affect it as much. It's not the same type of muscle as the muscles in your arms and legs. But it's still a muscle, and it'll, it'll build up and get a little larger, and then, and then it can only reach, your heart can only go so, so big, and they just blow up. And because, and your, their minds are the most things they lose. First, they lose their minds, not in the sense that, they, that they're uh, schizophrenic, but in the sense that they think they're, they actually think they're the world's most built or the most. And they want to continue to get bigger and, and better. And bigger and bigger and bigger. And then since then, I've read time after time, uh, football players in the NFL now are having, right on the edge, that edge where they started taking them about 25 years ago and they're having all the trouble with these guys now that are in that in that uh, little peak there. And then as it goes along, they'll have, it'll just keep mm -hmm. rolling over. In your profession, the fans obviously play a, a big part in, in 1980 in Chicago's incidents, International think... Amphitheater where a fan in the second balcony actually fired shots into the ring because he was so mad oh, that his yeah. favorite tag team had lost. How do you feel about the fans? Oh, the fans are... I'm glad they pay their money to get there because it made me a lot of money through there. See, everybody will come up and say, gee whiz, bruiser, you big dummy, don't you wish you were wrestling just starting today? I said, no, I've been the top money maker in the world, one of the top ten for 35 years. And I still continue to make as much as 90% of the wrestlers today. I said, no, but the, the reason I made so much money was I always wrestled Chicago, New York City, uh, Miami, Milwaukee, Minneapolis, Detroit. The, Detroit, St. Louis, Indianapolis, always the biggest, and I was always paid on a percentage. So if they drew in those days $20,000, I still made $2,000. I'd make 10% of the game. I'd make $2,000, so I'd make anywhere up to $10,000, $15,000 a week sometimes. So Dick the Bruiser, Hulk Hogan aside, can an average wrestler, there's, there are many more that, that aren't the stars of the sport, can the average wrestler make a decent salary? Oh, well, certainly there's some of these fellows with the makeup and should be in the hoochie coochie shows. <laughs> I'll bet you they make 50, 50 to 100,000 a year, whereas in my day, see, that would be the difference. I'd say the top men now make about what the top men did, only they don't work quite as often. I have worked quite a bit. You work what, four or five days a week sometimes, oh, six oh, days no, a week? Oh, I'd work almost seven days a week when I, uh, I was really at the very peak of my career uh, and the peak of my uh, performances. I'd work six, seven, eight. Sometimes in Canada, I'd wrestle two, two times a day. So when you travel that much, you're so close to your family. You have two children, Carl and Michelle. You're very close to them, close to your wife. When you travel so much, how did you make sure that that wasn't interrupted, oh, that that just, relationship? Just like today, I flew everywhere. I flew. In fact, it's easier today than it was then. Uh, not because of flying, but because of driving. I don't even bother to take a plane to Chicago. Mm -hmm. I can get to, from here to where I wrestle in Chicago in three hours. Well, if I take a plane from here to Chicago, which I did for years and years and years and years, it'd take me about five hours because I had to go to the airport, then to the, to the air, uh, fly to the other airport, then from that airport, an hour and a half back down to the amphitheater. It's most places, uh, anything over 250 miles, I fly anymore. But if it's under 250 miles, I drive and I get there on the super highways faster than I can. And if I fly, I'm only going a day day to two days the most. So I'm home most of the time. So how did the kids react to your profession when they were growing up? They're grown now, but how was it for them uh, back when they were in school? Dad was just dad? That's right. 
Your mother was a Democratic National Committee woman, so you grew up around politics. Did that in any way, shape, or form shape your life, shape your career? Well, I'm sure it did, Karen. My mother was a very positive person and was way ahead of her time. She was the first lady to run for Congress in the state of Indiana against uh, Congressman Halleck, the toughest, the longest, the most ferocious, vicious Republican that ever lived, and my mother ran against him and almost beat him. My mother was head of the probation and department in Indiana under both terms of Governor Schricker. She was way ahead of her time, and then she was became the Democratic National Committee woman for years and years in Indiana. So uh, my mother uh, shaped my career by giving me this positive force to go ahead, don't be afraid of anything. And uh, I really followed in her footsteps, although she never once told me what to do. Never once? That's right. You've been known to visit hospitals, not because you're obligated to do so, but because you want to do so. And I read a story where you visited a VA hospital and you said you didn't feel depressed, like most people say they do, that you felt that the guys really reacted to you and, and could relate to you. Is that one of the best parts of being who you are, that you can really touch people just by giving them an autograph or visiting them? Let me tell you a story. I love veterans because they served in wars. And I didn't. And uh, I uh, how I got to play football was I went to the University of Nevada and was uh, joined the ROTC. And I was one of uh, I was a very good student, and I became in the top 10 percent of the ROTC class, and I was able to receive a regular army commission. Well, at that time the Korean War was on, and I went to play with Green Bay, and I held this Army commission. And several times, about three times while I was with Green Bay, I was called on active duty. And the Green Bay Draft Board kept me around because I was a low profile, not because I was the greatest football player in the world, I was low profile tackle and guard. Now, we had some quarterbacks and halfbacks and all-American center linebackers that had to go. They released them and let them, they held kind of positions like I did in the Army and Navy, and they let, they made them go. But the draft board kept me right at Green Bay in the line there in the trenches, and after several times, why the Army took away my commission. Well, everything worked out. I never had to go to active duty, never got hurt in the Army, so I always felt you know, I, gee, I kind of cheated, I, uh, so I owe the government something. So my way of repaying what this land's given me is I go see all the veterans. And when I go there, the ones that are, are uh, have injuries, physical injuries, why well, I, I don't I don't relate to them, and they they see me come and say, oh, look at that big dummy coming here and you know and I would be the same way I wouldn't want to see somebody coming and think I have to talk to him when I've got a broken arm or a broken leg or my neck's twisted or I've got a bad back I wouldn't want to do that and I've done it for years and I finally figured that out gee these why do these people wince when I come by you know because they know what they if I was sick I certainly wanted wouldn't want to see me so I decided from now on I'm going to depend on going to the more or less the mental hospitals of the Veterans Association. So I visit the uh, people that are, have uh, dependency on things, mm -hmm. you know, substance abuse, mm -hmm. dope, different kinds, or alcohol abuse. I get in there with them and boy, they can relate to me, or mental, just mental re retardation, or they're mentally unbalanced. I don't care how, I've had, I was telling my wife yesterday, I was, came up uh, talking to somebody just a couple days ago, and that person hadn't said boo to anybody, but that's the way it is at the mental hospitals, even at Central State, I go there. They won't talk to anybody, and they're, and they're uh, just quiet and uh, catonic, I believe that's the name. 
until they see me and somehow they relate to me. And you get through to them. And I make some of them talk that haven't said a word or blinked an eye for a year, and I can get to them. So that's what, that's what I do if I have a chance. Okay, fans, we're ready to go with our first event. Already in the ring is a very popular cowboy, Bob Ellis, one of America's greatest wrestlers. We're waiting for his opponent. And from the booze, and the, wait a minute, here he comes, pretty boy Bobby Heenan. Pretty boy Bobby Heenan is entering the ring. We've got to find out what this is all about. He's in crutch. He's, uh, his knee is taped up. And, uh, he's... Uh, fans, here's pretty boy Bobby Heenan. Now, just a moment. Now, you're... you're You've signed to wrestle Cowboy Bob Ellis, and I saw you recently, and you were perfectly all right. Well, let me explain what happened. Came down to watch the matches. Now, as I did that, I fell and hit my knee on the step. I've had it checked, and I just can't wrestle tonight. Now, I came out here for one purpose. That's to show the people and everybody that I have good intentions. I wanted to beat this farmer, this hayseed hillbilly. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the scheduled match is Pretty Boy Bobby Heenan against Cowboy Bob Ellis. I wanted to wrestle him. I'm perfectly capable of wrestling him right now, but they won't let me wrestle. As you see, I have a brace on my leg. As iron supports, I'm on a crutch. I don't know how long I'll be on the crutch, but... I would like right now to have a postponement. Maybe in the next couple of months, maybe five or six months, then my knee will be ready, just like Lance's will hurt, and I'll be able to wrestle. I'll be able to wrestle. I, I just, He's mad enough to come up here and ask like a gentleman that he is. Yeah, that's more than a lot of people have shown. I just ask a little consideration as well. Bob, I think he's trying to edge his way out of the match. I don't know, but I said it was all right just not too long. Yes, I, uh, you're right there. No, like I said, I fell on the step. I hurt my leg. Would you check and see if it would be okay if they could postpone this for a couple months, maybe five or six months? If you sign for this match, then you've got to go through it. No, no, wait, no, gentlemen, no, about this, no, he's going to hurt me. I realize, I realize, I realize I signed for this. Fans, I, I, I don't know what to say. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know how, what what the outcome of this will be. Bob, Bobby Heenan has entered the ring with a crutch, claims that he cannot wrestle. Bob Ellis is ready. With Heenan are Lanza and Mulligan, and there's a big argument going on in the ring. We saw Heenan not too long ago, and he was all right, but you heard his explanation. are sanctioned by the State Athletic Commission, which has appointed as your referee, Henry Van Loon, the timekeeper, Harry Black. This match has a 15-minute time limit, one fall to a finish. Introducing at a weight of 252 pounds from San Angelo, Texas, the great cowboy, Bob Ellis. And his opponent for this match at 232 pounds from Beverly Hills, California, the one and only pretty boy, Bobby Heenan. Well, fans, I don't know how we can have this match because Heenan just claims he absolutely cannot wrestle. And uh, the referee doesn't believe him. Anyway, lands on Mulligan. Oh, Bobby Heenan ran at Ellis and attempted to hit him with the crutch. Ellis ducked. And now, oh, look at this cowboy, Bob Ellis. <laughs> Ellis is working over Lance on Mulligan. And Heenan is, oh, there it goes, the bulldog headlock. He has laid out 
Flash, and now he's working on Mulligan. Heenan is making himself scarce. He drops Mulligan. Hey, now he's chasing him. Now he's chasing Heenan. Lanza and Mulligan are out cold as a result of the Bulldog headlock. And Heenan is taking off. The man is chasing. Two, three. The man is chasing. The man's insane. You think I'm getting in with him? Hey. The referee is counting Heenan. The man's a lunatic. Heenan is on the outside. You kill me. Ladies and gentlemen. The match is over. You've been counted out. Count it out. The winner is Bob Ellis. Count it out. Fans, here he is, Cowboy Bob Ellis. Well, Bob, he tried to hit you with that crutch. Sure did, and boy, man. you really moved fast and got away. And fans, here, laying on the mat. They're on the mat right now. Lanza and Mulligan are still just about out as a result. Hey, Mr. Manager, I don't know what them studs got in for me. I didn't come up here to fight nobody like that, but if they want to fight, I'll show enough to oblige them. Well, you did a beautiful job. Lanza and Mulligan are still on the mat, and Heenan, who, of course, didn't have anything wrong with his leg, is helping them out. Well, I'd like you to notice how he's getting around on that leg now. Yeah. Nothing wrong with him now. Well, Bob, you know you are considered to be one of America's greatest and you certainly proved it today, the way you laid these fellows out. Well, I'll tell you, Mr. Maneker, I just like to fight good, clean wrestlers, and that's what I want, but if these studs want to play something rough, I'll show enough go with them. Well, they've got the rough men around here, and, uh, man, the way I, fans, I just can't get over the way Cowboy Bob Ellis went to work on Lanza and Mulligan, and he even made himself scarce. And as you pointed out, he moved, well, but, He's getting around pretty good on that leg. I think I ought to go get him right now before, before he gets out well, of that thing. You don't have to do it. You proved your point. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the great cowboy Bob Ellis. And I know there's a lot of rough guys around here that you can take care of. But I sure would like to try, Mr. Maker, and it's always nice talking to you. Thank yeah. you very much. Fans, cowboy Bob Ellis, what a great man. And there is... Well, What's he counting me out for? I've got a bad leg. Yes. Let me tell you something. Away. Let me tell you something. When a crazy man is chasing you, you can develop powers you wouldn't normally have. Lady. The leg is sore. He's trying to take advantage of me. The ref took advantage of me. Ladies and gentlemen, He's we'll... Mistake of well, fans, uh, we're ready to go. And here to introduce the contestants, Tom Mathis. Our referee for this match is the Dean of Wrestling Referees, Connie Barker. Introducing from Downers Grove, Illinois, weighing 230 pounds, Angelo Papo. And his opponent from Woodland Hills, California, at 252 pounds, ladies and gentlemen, the world's most scientific wrestler, Wilbur Snyder. Well, here we have two of the top wrestlers in America, Wilbur Snyder and Angelo Papo. The referee, one of the best, Connie Marker, a man who is very proud of his Greek heritage. He's known as the Golden Greek. Checking over some of the rules with the wrestlers, and uh, evidently there's some misunderstanding there because this little, oh, wait a minute. Papo took a sort of a half swing at Snyder. And we thought the action might start before the bell. Anyway, we're now ready to go, and there's the bell. Boy, that cowboy Bob Ellis really did a terrific job on Lanza, Mulligan, and Heenan in the previous match. Go behind by Wilbur Snyder. Double wrist lock and a good takedown, but both men quickly to their feet. Papo, a very dangerous wrestler. Takes a side headlock, now a hammerlock. He's moving very fast. Now Wilbur swings around out of it, reverses it. Has a hammerlock on Papo. <laughs> the 
Now again, Wilbur with the hammerlock. And now Wilbur caught him coming off the ropes, takes the hammerlock. In that uh, previous match, it's just very, very fortunate that Bob Ellis, with his quick reflexes, ducked when Bobby Heenan tried to hit him with the crutch because he certainly would have damaged Bob Ellis. But Ellis, whoa, what a comeback. He's a real nice, easy-going guy, but when he gets mad, fans, watch out. Again, Wilbur was brought down with a leg trip, but now he's on his feet. Referees hold back against the ropes, a punch by Papo, a quick comeback by Snyder. Again against the ropes. Watch this, the slap. Uh-oh. Boy, that really made Wilbur angry. Wilbur Snyder is after Popo, but Popo very quickly eluded him. Step back. Against the ropes now. And Wilbur. With a powerful slap, shook up Papo. There's Papo on the outside. Wilbur brings him in with an arm drag. Now he locks that arm, takes an arm bar hold. Angelo Papo. Is in trouble now as Wilbur works on that wrist and arm. A punch to the... Hey, Papo picks him up, a big body slam. He covers Wilbur. A two count, Wilbur gets away. What a slam! Boy, that Wilbur picked him up and threw him. About halfway across the ring. Papo back against the ropes. Getting up. Holding his back. Wilbur Snyder takes an overhand wrist lock on Angelo. Papo caught in the overhand wrist lock. There's a, well, he's just about to pull, the, pull Wilbur down by the trunk. Wilbur continuing the pressure. Now it trips him and he brings him to the mat. There he is with the armbar hold. A smash to the midsection breaks the hold up. And now Papo punches Wilbur continuously. Staggers him against the rope, throws him into the rope. Oh boy, Wilbur Snyder came off the rope with a tremendous smash to the face. Uh, Papo sent him to the mat. Papo getting up slowly. Wilbur takes over. Side headlock over the hip to the mat. Oh, that Connie Marker really jumped over both of those men. He's very, very agile. Now there, there's Papo caught in this headlock, but he brought Wilbur over, attempted to pin him. He's a tough competitor. He does it again, but he pulls the trunks in doing so. He pulls the trunks of Snyder. There's a side headlock. And he crashes into the mat. Beautiful hammerlock. One of the matches uh, we'll be seeing today, uh, if time permits, the Baron, Baron Von Roschke, will be in there against the Polish Giant. Rosano, big man, over seven feet tall, over 420 pounds in weight. We're really looking forward to that match. 
Snyder on the mat, but his leg on over the rope, and it's, it's a break. But on the break, uh, Papo keeps punishing Snyder with kicks. Now he's got him by the arm. And he sends him flying into the turnbuckle. He sends him across to the other turnbuckle. Keeps smashing away. And Angelo Papo now with a big flying mare. Now a reverse chin lock on Wilbur Snyder. Very tough Wilbur Snyder caught in his hole. Papo punishes him. This is a very powerfully applied hold, this reverse chin lock. And this could weaken Snyder down. As Papo, he released the hold, it was a strangle momentarily. Now a choke hold, the referee counts to make him break it up. Again, he goes for the reverse chin lock. And again, I believe it's a choke hold. Now the referee checking it, it is not. This hole, the reverse chin lock, is not necessarily a winning hole, but it weakens a man very much. And Wilbur Snyder, who's in terrific condition, is fighting very hard. Papo puts more and more relentless pressure on the hole. And here's Wilbur getting up to his feet, fighting against the... Oh, he's on his feet. He throws Papo into the rope, ducks Papo over him. He jumps over Papo. Oh, a beautiful flying head scissors. What a terrific move by Wilbur Snyder. Papo goes for the rope, but the referee breaks that up. Papo persistently puts his feet on those ropes, and the referee must break it up. What a terrific match this is, man, with these two top-notch wrestlers. Angelo Papo and Wilbur Snyder. And now Papo back in the corner. And he's walking around, trying to keep away from Wilbur, hoping that Wilbur will rush him, but Wilbur won't. He's too smart for that. Oh, man, a real good smack to the face by Wilbur. He slams Wilbur into the turnbuckle. And does so again. Now he's punishing Snyder. A kick right to the face. That staggers Wilbur Snyder. There's a flying field. Wow, what a drop kick right to the face. He picks him up and a big body slam. And Wilbur Snyder with an A drop. But Papo under the rope. Angelo Papo, when he's in trouble, gets close to those ropes, always looking for an automatic break. Papo tried a leg dive, but Wilbur too fast for him. Wilbur with a half Nelson. Nope, now he brings him over the other way, trying to press his shoulders to the mat. Papo fighting against this. Wilbur has both arms. Try oh, no, Papo's got one arm away. And he tried a front headlock, but Wilbur spins him around and takes a hammerlock. It's a tremendous match. These two tough wrestlers in here. Oh, a punch by Papo, another punch. He keeps punching Wilbur. He charges into Wilbur, but Wilbur kicks him and now punches him. A smash to the side of the head. He goes into those ropes, comes off with a flying tackle. A big back drop. Now Papo tackles Snyder to the mat. And there's Wilbur. He spins around and takes the abdominal stretch. What a pop It's all over. Papo gives up. The winner of the match is the great Wilbur Snyder. Fans, a beautiful victory by Wilbur Snyder. We'll be back in a moment, so please stand by.
Johnny Starr, the man who accompanies Ox Baker, the champion, all over, takes care of his business. And of course, uh, uh, handsome Johnny Starr wanted to be here today because of what occurred last week at the wrestling matches when Ox Baker was wrestling Cowboy Bob Ellis and uh, Bold Eagle got in there. He threw a big tin wastebasket in there, attacked the ox. And, uh, you know, after all, you shouldn't object to that because it was a Texas death match. Anything goes. Just a second. Not anything goes, Sam. I was there as Ox was second. Now, Ox can't be here today. He's in California, so I came to speak for him. I was there as the Ox was second. Bold Eagle was there to interfere in the match and nothing else. I don't know what he was doing there. He's a wild Indian. He's now a maniac. Just a moment. Now, just now, a moment. You were there seconding the ox, right? I was. And, the, and Ellis wanted Eagle to second him, which I think That's was all right. That's not the way it happened, Sam. Bold Eagle knew he and Ellis had decided before this match ever started that they were going to have a little conspiracy out there to injure the ox. Well, nobody can injure the ox. Ox is the, the meanest, most sadistic man in the world. He can hurt anybody. Bold Eagle is a fool for even trying anything like this. But the point is, he jumped into the uh, ring, he interfered with the match, he tried to injure me. I was an innocent bystander just watching the match. That's all and I ever because do. because of this, you, you've issued a challenge. This is exactly it. right. The Ox sent me here to issue a challenge to this lunatic, Bold Eagle, and uh, also to Cowboy Bob Ellis or anybody that Bold Eagle wants to get. In we other don't words, care. The Ox and you as a team That's will take right. on Bold Eagle and any partner he gets. That's right, because I want to tell you something, Sam. The Ox is in the process of making me the, the meanest wrestler in the world, uh, up on the same level with him, the most sadistic. And, and I'm not far from there well, right thank now. you. We'll hear now, more about that challenge a little later. And now let's get back to wrestling following these messages. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be talking with another guest in just a moment. I do want to remind you, we're with you every week at the same time on television here on Channel 3. And, of course, when we do have wrestling in Champaign or in uh, Danville, Illinois. We'll keep you informed, so just keep watching our show every week, and as the next cards come up, we'll tell you where they are, where to get tickets, and so on. There was a lot of excitement last week uh, when uh, uh, the Ox and uh, Bold Eagle were in that Texas death match. Uh, correction, that was the Ox against Ellis, but Eagle got in there, and I mean it was wild, and a little while ago you heard handsome Johnny Starr speaking for Ox Baker and himself, and they have issued a challenge to Bold Eagle and any partner he gets. And we're going we're gonna to find out from Bold Eagle if he's uh, ready for that and if he has a partner or if he's thinking of a partner. And here he is, Chief Bold Eagle. Bold Eagle. Uh, Sam, it's a pleasure getting here. I, I don't know. Uh, when, back, when you were back in the dressing room, did you by any chance listen on the monitor and see it, what uh, Starr said? He issued a challenge. Right. He and Ox Baker have challenged you and any partner you want. Well, he challenged me. That's all right with me because I have a couple of little partners. I have one in particular in mind, but I'm not going to tell you right now. I just want them to come brag and tell how tough they are because after they get to the top of the mountain, how tough they are, we're going to break them down, get them all the way down to the bottom, and kick them from post to post. So just beware. It's a warning. I have a partner, and I will accept your challenge. Well, we'll be waiting to hear who your partner is, and uh, we'll be waiting to hear uh, more from the Ox and handsome Johnny Starr. You know, they issued a challenge, but maybe when it comes down to signing the contract, they may not do so. But anyway, we know that you're anxious to get at them, and I'm sure you'll have a great partner, and thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, fans, back to wrestling following these messages. Well, ladies and gentlemen, here's Wilbur Snyder. No, well, wait a minute. I understand. I've seen what's happened here tonight, and I think that these supposedly are wrestlers, uh, the world's heavy, these champions, and this and that. Uh, I have heard what they have said about the commission, and I think that they're trying to take di disadvantage of a man who cannot speak English from a foreign country, and I am here to see that nothing happens to him in this match. Now, I'm going to be right at this ringside. So I know that it's a one fall, but there's nothing going to happen to this man in this match as long as I'm here at the ringside. He shouldn't be here.
Ladies and gentlemen, Wilbur Snyder volunteered to be in the Giants corner because Baron Barowski has a manager in his corner and the Baron got some brass knuckles. They're on his hand right now and he punched Wilbur Snyder. Wilbur is bleeding. We'll have to get our ambulance attend attendant to help him out. Wilbur, Wilbur Snyder is bleeding. Get him over to a chair, please. Wilbur Snyder is, the blood is just pouring out of Snyder's head and he will be attended to. The match has officially started and the giant rushes in and he gives a big flying bill and a punch to Baron Von Roschke. He picks him up. Whoa, what a big body slam. The fans going wild. I can't, Wilbur is back. The blood is just pouring out of his head and the ambulance attendant is working on him. And now, oh, a tremendous headbutt by Andre Rosanoff. Snyder is on the other side. He's on a chair. Here's Rosanoff. There's Wilbur, he's being attended to there. Rosanoff just crashed the Baron into the corner and Rosanoff way ahead of the Baron. What a powerful man. When Wilbur came down to the ring, there was a discussion about this match because it was supposed to be a two out of three fall match. And it turns out that it's just a one fall match. The Giant wanted a two out of three, but evidently he got his way, it's a one fall match. And Wilbur volunteered to be in the Giant's corner, but unfortunately, he was attacked by the Baron. Got a bad cut on his head. A back break across the leg. He's got him covered. A two count and the Baron gets away. Boy, look at this giant. Standing on the barn. The giant just about tears the ears off of the barn with that twisting ankle head scissors he had. Watch this now. Oh, a tremendous punch to the Baron's head. And he falls back almost out of the ring. The man's out screaming. There's a smash to the head. And this Andrei Rosanov, the Polish giant, is a tremendous wrestler. He's doing a terrific job in there. He's working that Baron over very well. Snyder on the outside, being attended to by the ambulance attendant. His head is bandaged up. And pretty boy Bobby Heenan is on the, on the opposite side. He is really worried about his man, the Baron, who is now bleeding from the nose as Rosanoff continues pummeling him and punching him. 
Now he has him in a standing head scissors. He drops the Baron to the mat. A body drop with all his weight across the thigh of Baron Von Rossi. A fan going wild here as he does it again. Man, look at him go to town. He pulls him up by the ears. A tremendous smash. Hey, pretty boy Bobby Heenan pulls the Giant's leg. And that got the Giant off his feet and gave the Baron a chance to work on him as he's doing now. Works on his eyes. And for the first time in the match, the Giant in trouble due to the intervention by Bobby Heenan. Pulled his leg. He brings him over. The Giant brings him over. Aaron drops him. Now the Baron is biting him. See, here comes Boba Snyder. He got into the ring. He's all bandaged up, but he got in there. Oh, man. Look at this Boba Snyder. He sends the Baron into the ropes and takes he had him in an abdominal stretch but he got in there the giant is in trouble because he he was gouging the eyes or something was put in his eyes and here Wilbur Snyder again takes the abdominal stretch the giant has been blinded he can't do much at the moment Bobby Heenan got in there. This match is just getting out of hand. Wilbur Snyder, the referee, can't get him to leave. We are running out of TV time. Look at this, Snyder. He's right after him. He sends him into the ropes. He takes the abdominal stretch. And Hina gets in there again. I don't know what he put in the giant's eyes. He can't move the giant. His eye, he was, he must have put some pepper or something in there. As Wilbur, he slams him. Oh, that Wilbur is really going to town. Snyder sends him into the ropes. He takes the abdominal stretch again. He puts the abdominal. Now the giant goes after him. 